All right, we have here the 2022 Land Rover Defender. This is a vehicle that I didn't think I would like this much because if you look at it, right, this looks like one big, tall, wallowy box. You might think it would drive imprecise, but I was absolutely wrong about the way that this vehicle drives. Before we get into the drive, let's talk about the exterior of this car. But before we get into this video any further, I just wanted to take some time to shout out Simply Carbon Fiber for sponsoring this video. It's because of companies like this supporting the little guy such as myself that I even get to do these reviews for you guys. Us car enthusiasts, we love our carbon fiber and everything that Simply Carbon Fiber makes is made for real carbon fiber, like this wallet that they have sent here with the money clip in the back. I don't wanna take the cards out because I don't wanna reveal my personal information. Not that you would get much out of me anyway, but <laughs> so if you wanna adopt this minimalistic lifestyle, then you can definitely do that. But if you do want the traditional bifolding or tri-folding wallet, they also sell that. Also made from real carbon. And they also have phone cases, sunglasses, jewelry, you name it, they have it. It's all made from real carbon fiber. So if you have a car enthusiast in your life that you want to give to as a gift, a significant other, or if you just want to get it for yourself, I will have a 10% discount code. The code will be ESA that you can use throughout their website to grab any of their carbon fiber goodies. So with that established, let's go ahead and get back into this video. Because the exterior and the appeal of this matters way more than the actual off-road capabilities of this even. Which might sound like blasphemy, but it's true. We'll talk about that inline six here in a little bit as well. Everybody out on the road, they love looking at this. They're smiling, they're pointing at it. This is just what people love now. They love off-roading, they love SUVs and trucks. It's a shame because I grew up loving sedans and cars and sports cars, coupes. That's what I grew up loving. That love has subsided and these SUVs have taken over people's hearts instead. But that's why I probably shouldn't have liked this more than I do, but I love driving this thing around. And the appeal of it, the swagger, the looks of it, it certainly does add to the enjoyment of driving it around. We live in a very superficial world and I have to admit, I like the way it looks and apparently so does everybody else. This, however, does not have the Explorer package or the Adventure package with a little box on the side. That's an absolute must for me. I would pay up the three or four grand to get either one of those packages to get that little box. But this one does have the 20 inch black wheels. I wouldn't particularly go with these wheels. I would go with like a five spoke design. I would definitely stick to the 20s and not the 22s because I'm liking the way that this rides as well. But I think because of supply chain shortages and other nonsense, it's kind of difficult to get a hold of a adventure package or a Explorer package. That's why this vehicle doesn't have it. The way that this car is stickered here, it's about $76,000. Ideally, I would have this specced up to around $81,000 with one of those packages because that's just what you need to make this a desirable vehicle when you go to sell it later on got to look a certain way and I don't know I think personally what I really like about it is kind of that rear end I like that simplistic taillight design and it has like this Lego slash toy design to it and I mean that in a very good way both the exterior and the interior it has like this toy kind of childish design to it and again I mean that as a compliment anyway you can leave your thoughts below in the comment section what your thoughts are with the exterior let's transition over into this drive now shall we We have here the three liter inline six engine with the mild hybrid system producing 395 horsepower and 406 pounds feet of torque. This is definitely the engine of choice. There is a four cylinder turbo. That's the base engine. Skip that. If that's what you're going to be buying with this, then don't even buy this vehicle at all. Uh, just get the Velar or like the Evoque or something like that. This vehicle really comes to life when you get the inline six engine. There's also a V8 engine option. <laughs> if you got over $100,000 burning a hole in your pocket, then go ahead, get that because that should be a pretty special vehicle. Um, kind of competes with the G63 AMGs, but again, it's gonna be over six figures.
But for around $80,000, this is kind of the value proposition in the lineup. This already doesn't get like amazing fuel economy. It's rated to get around 17 in the city and 22 on the highway. I expected this to do a little bit better in the highway, but I was averaging about 20 MPG in the highway. And I do genuinely get between 17 to 18 MPG with harder driving in the city. So that I'm impressed with. That's pretty good for a vehicle of this size and weight, which it weighs around 5,000 pounds the way it's spec'd here. So there's almost no lag with it at all. And the eight speed transmission does a great job kicking down. I really do like this powertrain system. It's very impressive. That's why the V8 only get that if you're rich enough to afford it, because that'll probably be the last V8 Defender ever made. And this powertrain still continues to pull out of the highway, despite this being a big box. But really driving this hot blooded is really missing the point. What really impressed me is this is a supreme daily driver. That's what's impressive about it. This is so satisfactory just doing the speed limit. That's where this really shines. Now I get it, this is built to be one of the most capable off-roaders. This is the most capable Land Rover Range Rover product ever built, this body structure, right? This chassis, this body, whatever you wanna call it. This is the toughest rugged body that they've ever put into any Land Rover Range Rover product. So you know this is built for abuse. What does that mean for you, the everyday consumer that's going to be buying this and doing 15 miles an hour under the speed limit? Absolutely nothing. You're going to be taking this to all the all your pretentious locations like your Nordstrom's, your Starbucks, your Whole Foods, your country clubs. That's where this is going to reside and that's where it belongs because this is over $80,000. Don't destroy it. Nobody's going to off-road it, but I don't even recommend you off-roading this. Total waste of time, you know. If that's what you're into just get a freaking Wrangler or something if you really want to tear up an off-road. But I get why they do this. They do this to fill up a spec sheet so you can tell your friends all the accomplishments that this vehicle has under its belt. You can absolutely climb a mountain in this. That's not even to be disputed. This is one of the most capable vehicles on the planet, but you just want to be able to tell your friends that you can do all this stuff. That's why I wouldn't even load this thing up with all the off-road goodies because it's just going to be a waste and you're overcomplicating this vehicle more than you need to. You can get an air suspension option on this that kind of auto levels and detects when you're in the water and it'll raise itself and all this other nonsense. Totally not necessary. I only want the Explorer package and the Adventure package because it looks cool, not for its uh, off-road capabilities and the raised air intakes. I don't even care about that. This thing handles so well. That's what really impressed me about it. When I first got in it, you would think this is some imprecise bread box, but it's not. The steering has the correct weight to it. There's no play in it. It tracks straight. It doesn't do anything weird. And you would think it's really top heavy, but it's not. It feels almost like all the weight is below, like the center of gravity is really low in this vehicle. So it corners decently well, not that you're gonna be driving the piss out of it and throwing it into corners, but it's nice to know that it's a non-fatiguing driving experience. Your occupants aren't being swayed left to right or anything like that. When you get hard on the brakes, you don't get thrown into the, into the front windshield or anything like that. It remains neutral, it remains balanced, even when you like step on it. Again, you don't end up in the trunk of this thing, right? But you know it's powerful, you know it's surging off. All those right sensations are there. Now, I mentioned the air suspension. Again, this thing is riding so well with these 20 inch wheels. I definitely wouldn't get the 22s, that might ride a little too firm. But this right here is soaking up all the bumps, the large ones, the small ones, extremely well. It doesn't jostle you about when you go over uneven terrains. Really well done. It's got super meaty kind of double wishbone suspensions. It's really overkill, this machine. But here's where we're going to get into the cons. Really, the only con I have driving this is with the kind of wind noise. There's always going to be this constant wind buffeting effect, especially when you get up to like 75 miles an hour. It's not, it shouldn't bother you, but it's just a constant noise that's there. Even at like 50 miles an hour on a windy day, you're going to get that. They do not use double pane glass here. 
although that would have helped, but I don't mind it because this is an off-roader, kind of, in my opinion, competes with things like the Bronco and the Jeep Wranglers, right? It's not really trying to be like a Porsche Cayenne or a Mercedes GLE competitor, which both of them were right in front of me there. But this isn't trying to be like every other boring SUV. This is supposed to make you connected with the outside world a little bit, so I don't mind that there's a little bit of that wind buffeting taking place here. Another thing, they really nailed the seating position in this. When you park this vehicle, when you look at it, it looks like a massive vehicle, yet when you drive it every day, it feels really small to drive. You can situate it within the lines rather easily, even in rush hour traffic or in a downtown area, it doesn't feel annoying to drive around. And so I love large vehicles that can manage to feel small or half their size while still giving you that commanding view over the street. Now, the other major con with this, it's a freaking Land Rover product. I understand that this is a new car and it comes with a four year, 50,000 mile warranty. That's all nice, but these things just always have random issues with it, right? And that's kind of what deters me from the brand because I love driving this. I love the appeal of it. I think it's super impressive what they've been able to do here, both from an on-road perspective and the off-road perspective, more so from the on-road because this does everything that something like a Jeep Wrangler can do, but it has like that luxury car feel to it at the same time. But you hear all these horror stories, like the vehicle just randomly turns off on you. And that's kind of what pushes me towards, you know, something like a Porsche Cayenne or a Porsche Macan, something with more of a proven track record compared to like these Range Rover products. They say that they're trying to improve the reliability of these, yet TFL goes through three of these things. You know, that's what pisses me off. That's what turns me away. You just gotta know what you're getting into. You know, hopefully you're one of those people that doesn't run into one of those horror stories because there are some people that, oh, I've owned my supercharged Range Rover since 2013 and I put 150,000 miles on it and I've never had an issue. There are those people out there, but I don't think I'm one of those people. <laughs> Nothing ever good happens to me. And it's these little nonsense things that pushes people towards, you know, brands like Lexus and Acura. They've just had enough of dealing with this crap, but the appeal, the swagger, the coolness of it, <laughs> it just keeps people in, you know, and they make excuses for stuff like this, for Ferraris, you know, no matter how much they screw up, people don't have an issue with it. So I don't know, it just depends on who you are. I would choose this over the Range Rover Sport and the full-size Range Rover because this is cheaper by several tens of thousands of dollars while offering you so much interior space. But if you want a lower end Range Rover product, I would definitely go with like the Velar or the Evoque. Uh, mainly the Velar, I like the size of that as well. But we'll end off with some quick specs for you here. 5.8 seconds to 60 and it does like about 120, 125 miles per hour top speed. Stability is good at those higher speeds. Again, the on-road demeanor of this, it might even be worth the headaches that you might have to go through with this. So with that established, let's go ahead and let's talk about this interior space now. So now that we are done with the drive, let's go ahead, take a detailed look at this interior space. Let's start out with the seats here because we have here the black kind of pseudo leather seats mixed in with some interesting textile materials right here, like a very durable rubberized material kind of running all across this interior space. You can pay an extra $2,600 to upgrade this to real leather and kind of a cognac interior and all that stuff. But I personally like this ruggedized material. It pretty much does feel like a leather seat for the most part. It's very comfortable, so I do appreciate that. And you do have plenty of lumbar support. It's a very non-fatiguing seat for sure. Uh, I mostly just get lower back pains when I do a longer trip. So the lumbar support in this, truly excellent. I like this interesting plastic molding that they use for the steering rack or the steering wheel if you will and we also have riveting going across the interior space as well you see it here 
in the center console space. It's just a very interesting and ruggedized design that I really appreciate. It's just unlike any other luxury vehicle, if you will. It just has its own little thing going on. You have the one-touch automatic windows for all four windows. It is not double-pane glass, and you have the three-way memory seats here. And the Meridian sound system in here is actually the 700-watt Meridian sound system, I believe they made that standard for 2022 because before you had a couple of different options a base audio system along with a 400 watt meridian sound system and the 700 watt so now you just get this as standard but it still kind of sounds muddled to my ear it's not super clear like some of the other range rover products i've tested and i think that's because they have reinforced these speaker grills in case you go underwater, right, to stand the test of time. It's just cool little things you can tell your friends, but yeah, because of that, the sound system is a little bit more muddled. You have the electronic parking brake, but as soon as you put the vehicle into park, the parking brake will automatically turn on. And there's the, uh, that's how you open up the engine bay because you'll probably have to do that eventually in this. You have the full kind of digital display here. And we also have here the 10 inch Pixie Pro, Pivi Pro, whatever this infotainment system is called. And it's kind of one of their newer infotainment systems. I've used it before in the Velar that I reviewed. And it's it's pretty much the best system that they've come across, but it's just still a lot of menus for me. It's not super simple for me to get used to, but you know, if you're an owner of this, I'm sure you can get used to it. It's not a big deal. You do have the wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is definitely a nice touch there's some interesting features that you can uh, play with here as well vehicle dimensions shows you all the the size of the vehicle the approach angles your clearance levels if you will right very very interesting yeah a lot of little toys that you can play with but as i already mentioned before this is really something that you pull up to the country clubs in and you just tell people that you have all these features you can play with all these uh hill descent controls, climbing a mountain, whatever all this nonsense is that you're never going to play with or touch, you have it here. You can tell your friends all about it. The digital gauge cluster that we have here, very simple, no problems here. It's very crisp, very clear. And I like how they still give you the physical controls. They didn't go with that stupid dual screen system here. You have the physical controls, the knobs, the switches, and you can press in on this. You can access your heated seats, but apparently there's no cooled seats. So that's a little disappointing, but the heated seats fortunately do work extremely well, right? And this is pretty easy for the most part. No problems here. This is how you access your fan speed controls. It's your uh, reverse camera here, 360 camera here as well. Press P for park and the automatic parking brake turns on for you. I like how all of the safety features are pretty much as standard, like the blind spot monitoring, lane keep assist, the radar cruise control features here. That's all great touches, and it should be standard for a vehicle of this price point. You have your USB, your USB-C, little auxiliary ports here as well. As you can see here, you have plenty of usable space. The cup holders are massive. You have this large gaping hole in the middle of the center console to put like a purse, a large bag, whatever you want there. You have a rubberized material here, so nothing's gonna be really moving around with a USB-C port here as well. It says Defender here, this rugged plastic material. And you even have some storage space behind the infotainment screen. And if I haven't mentioned it already, you can upgrade this Pivi Pro 10 inch screen to an 11.4 inch screen if you want but not really necessary. I think this is perfect as is. You have a large panoramic sunroof here. This turns on as soon as I turn on the vehicle, which is kind of interesting. And another interesting thing about this vehicle, we have here a refrigerator in the center console or the center armrest here. Very interesting. It's not very large though, unfortunately, but it is refrigerated. It is an extra option, pretty cool. Another area to put your cell phone, right? And here's your glove box space. Not too much if you have the the books in there, but you can take that out, put it in the trunk, do whatever, and it's not a bad space. Now let's go ahead 
jump into the rear seats. But before I do, I just want to show you this is the amount of legroom that you're working with here. Definitely an abundance of rear legroom compared to the other Range Rover models. This is actually useful. You can put large adults back here, not even an issue. Same durable, easy to clean seats that are very comfortable. Climbing in and out is a bit more of a challenge in the rear, but it's not too terrible. And as you can see, plenty of space back here. This and the Velar truly surprised me with how much space is back here because the Range Rover Sport and even the full-size Rover that I've checked out, not that much space surprisingly. And you have all the climate control. You have the three-way optional climate control with the air quality sensor, which is a great touch. I would definitely pay up the $1,200 to get that. So your rear occupants do have their own climate control to play with along with the USB-C connectivity and auxiliary ports as well. And I apologize for the glare. So here's a full look at the interior from behind. So you get a good look there, right? It's clean, it's simplistic. I'm surprised at how ergonomic everything is in here. There's no real learning curve. Aside from the, the infotainment, you just need to learn how to menu jump in here. But outside of that, everything is pretty ergonomic, pretty intuitive. I appreciate it. The overall driving position in this, super easy to see out of. I initially thought that these side view mirrors might be kind of stupid and useless, but they're really not. It's very simple to see out of this. You get that tall driving position, but it's still very easy to whip around. It really masks its size, as I already mentioned in the driving segment. So really well done there. And you can even sit in the middle because it's relatively flat here. So you can actually definitely put five adults back here, no problem. And you have a little USB port here as well. And a coat hook, right? Anyway, let's talk about the, the trunk next. Getting out of it, again, a little bit of a difficulty for some, but not too terrible. Opens up sideways, you have the uh, spare tire in the back. And plenty of space back here, that's not even remotely an issue. The rear of this, they were very smart. They kind of uh, reinforce it in the back so it doesn't get all messed up. And yeah, there it is. Obviously the spare tire is right here but you do have some additional storage here as well. So there you have it. You also have a little dial that you can play with here as well. And auxiliary. And of course you can fold down these seats. doesn't lay flat but it can help out a little bit an interesting thing to note this is actually glass because if you look right here you can actually see through it so that's pretty cool for the rear occupants this can be had as a seven seater if you want you can actually have a third row in here i definitely would not get that that's a complete waste because just use it as a practical five seater that's just the way to go and use that excellent amount of trunk space and you should be good to go here. Having extra two seats, not the most practical thing. You can't really fit adults back there anyway. So I would just get it like this. So that's an overall look at the interior. Let's go ahead and let's talk about the conclusions next. This is one of the most impressive vehicles I have tried from this brand. It's, it's my go-to, really. This is the vehicle I would get, and if you can afford it, that V8 seems like a blast, but I would just get the inline six. I would pay the 80 grand. Sure, it starts at 50, but this is how you wanna spec it out. Skip all of the extra uh, off-roading nonsense. The only thing I would check off is maybe like the limited slip differentials, the electronic diff, the stability, the ride quality, the handling, all excellent. You just have to deal with a little bit of wind buffeting, which is totally appropriate for an off-roader like this. And I think you're gonna appreciate this ruggedized interior as well. Like the outside, the inside, it all has such a cool demeanor to it. Let me know if you're an owner of this thing, how it's held up for you, if you like it, if you enjoy it. Let me know your thoughts. Thanks again for watching. Take care and goodbye.